Hello, you're welcome to the Live It Up podcast right here. A podcast on life, lessons, and survivorship with non-communicable diseases. Uh, as you know, this season we're going through cancer, and uh, today we have uh, Dr. Joyce Balagade. I'll be introducing her more shortly after. But my name is Brandy Valentine, Communications, Uganda Child Cancer Foundation. And we are happy to be here doing this podcast for you and with you. And we're proudly sponsored by the Uganda Child Cancer Foundation, the Uganda Cancer Institute, the Tribe UG, and Afron. Uh, today we will talk about childhood cancer care, where it has come from, where it's going, what we need to do to make it better, and uh, you can be part of this. You can not, you can be part of this podcast not only by by listening, but also donating a thing or two to the children battling cancer. Uh, let's get into it. Uh, you're welcome, Dr. Joyce. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. So for everyone who wants to know who she is, here is a brief profile. Dr. Joyce is the Chief of Pediatric Oncology at the Uganda Cancer Institute, and she's also a research investigator with the UCI Hutchinson Center Cancer Alliance. She's also the first childhood cancer specialist in Uganda. She doubles as the incoming continental president of the International Society of Pediatric Oncology, CEOP Africa. And with more than 10 years experience in the field, Dr. Balaga Despia headed the establishment of a dedicated pediatric oncology service at UCI and later a fellowship program in the pediatric oncology. I'm still going guys. Joyce is passionate about she's a passionate advocate for childhood cancer care in developing countries such as Uganda and other and the sub-Saharan and believes that every child with cancer deserves the best treatment possible within the confines of the available resources in the place available. Uh, Joyce holds a master's degree in pediatrics and child health from Macquarie University and a certificate of medical oncology from the University of Cape Town. She's now engaged in extending pediatric cancer services to regional hospitals in the country and uh, modification of the National Cancer Control Plan. You're welcome, Dr. Joyce. Thank you, Brandy, for those very kind words. I'm actually wondering if you're speaking about me. <laughs> it is you, my dear. <laughs> um, thank you for that kind introduction. Yeah, well done. Um, let's get into the podcast. What inspired you to become a pediatric oncologist? So... <coughs> Um, first of all, I've always wanted to be a pediatrician. Yeah. I've always loved children, um, but that's true of all pediatricians. You have to love children to be a pediatrician. So, um, But pediatric oncology specifically, I think um, it's my sense, it was my sense at that time of what I could do to contribute yeah. I stumbled into the Cancer Institute by mistake. Yeah. I was <laughs> fresh out of training uh, in medical school, postgrad school. Yeah. And I was doing um, private work mostly with clinics, uh, Caserina Children's Clinic that I enjoyed and so forth. But I wasn't really sure what I needed to do with my life thereafter. Yeah. And then I was encouraged to come and spend a day at the Cancer Institute and round. And I thought to myself, what on earth am I going to do with people that have cancer I had almost no experience at all yeah no training at all in that area so but when I came and did that first round first of all I was so touched because I was rounding mostly with physicians yeah. also love children but children are not little adults so there was a lot of things that being a pediatrician could actually add to the life of the children with cancer here because there were things that could have been managed better. Yeah. You know? Things like diarrhea, for example, dehydration, things like malaria, things like malnutrition that didn't require you to be a, a trained oncologist but to, uh, but still be able to make a difference. Yeah. And at that time, there was no pediatrician at all. Yeah. So I thought to myself, why are we pediatricians all clamoring to look after healthy children? Yeah. And there's many of us there looking after the fairly healthy children with malaria, for example, or yeah. whatever. And then here are these children with cancer that are so critically ill and none of us is here. Yeah. So I felt like I could make a difference here. And uh, when I came, I never ever went back. I resigned my job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and came and worked here for about 18 months as a volunteer. Yes. And the rest is history. I've been here since. Yeah. We are happy to have you here. Yeah. It's 
been an experience. It still is an experience. I consider it my home. Yeah. It has shaped my life in ways that I could have never you know, imagined. Yeah, and yeah. broadened my horizons. I love it. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, cur- uh, currently, what is the childhood cancer burden in Uganda? So, according to Globocan, and Globocan is an international organization that uh, takes statistics and is able to tell us with some degree of precision, um, with the available information, how much cancer we can expect to arise from what country at what time. Yeah. So, according to this organization, it's called Globocan, uh, its report from 2018 Um, we expect 3000 children with cancer every year under the age of 18 yeah and so really that means that every day eight children will develop cancer yeah and yeah. that's a really really big burden it's one of the highest incidences of cancer in the world yeah okay uh, so how many do all these 3000 present so actually that's a very good question so even though we expect 3000 children with cancer and therefore we would want 3000 children to present for care the reality is only about 25% of these 3000 present for care um for, for care at a, can- a cancer treatment center so for example at the cancer institute we get between 600 and 700 new children with cancer mm. uh, a year yeah and so and then another 150 in barara okay so at the end of the day the overwhelming majority more than 70% are not being diagnosed mm-hmm. they're dying out there somewhere yeah. no chance at cure at all yeah, yeah. okay so that's a problem all right so if i had a child or like a little sister or a little brother what signs and symptoms am i looking out for okay so i think i need to start off that answer <coughs> by saying that the signs and symptoms of cancer in children mm are very similar to the signs and symptoms of a sick child yeah. any other disease yeah and that is one of the reasons that makes diagnosis of cancer very challenging okay why because compared to other diseases of children cancer is rare you know because i mean malaria is more common diarrhea sickle cell disease malnutrition are more common yeah. but cancer presents in the exact same way as those diseases So it becomes very challenging sometimes for a parent to decide that now this symptom is not malaria it's actually cancer. Yeah. Having said that, the commonest ways in which children present I would say is one a swelling. Yes. That's unexplained. Usually painful anywhere on the body. Generally our bodies should not have swelling. Yes. So your child should not have a swelling somewhere on their hand and it shouldn't be there. And even if it's not painful, it must not be there. You need to check it out because mm. many times cancer is a swelling. Mm. Um, painless most of the time until it's more advanced. Mm. So that's the swelling. Two, <coughs> unexplained abnormal bleeding. Mm. What do I mean by this? Um, children will bleed, obviously. They play around, fall down, hurt themselves, and then they bleed. Yes. Or they lose a tooth, you know, yes. a milk tooth. And then the gum bleeds for you know at most maybe even five minutes, yes. and then it stops. So that's normal bleeding. Mm. But abnormal bleeding is bleeding that doesn't stop. So you took your child to the dentist, they took out a tooth, and it's two days later, mm. and it's still oozing. Yeah. That's not normal, you yeah. know. And parents keep saying, "Oh, you see, they took out the tooth. They took out the tooth, but within five minutes, with that little cotton, by the time you exit the dentist." Yeah. There's no more bleeding you thrown away the piece of cotton wool you see. True. So this kind of bleeding that's prolonged or bleeding from the gums yeah. you know that's oozing that's unexplained yeah. or bruising that's unexplained. So you look at your child and somewhere on the hand there's this big red blotch or dark blotch because we're dark skinned. Mm. So that kind of abnormal bleeding or bruising is a flag. Yeah. Okay for 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 some of the cancers. Okay. Then we have the white pupil When you look at your eye, yeah. the inside of the eye is black. True. The pupil is black, you know? Regardless of the color of your eyes. <laughs> the inside of the eye, the pupil is black. Yeah. But if that pupil is white, that's not normal. It doesn't mean your child is special or anything. Yeah. That's a sign of cancer yeah. or one of the other diseases that, you know, that might not be cancer but still, that's a flag. And this is normally in younger children less than a year. 
So four weeks, six weeks, one, two, three, four months. If you look at your child and their pupil in the eye is white, that child needs to be looked at uh, carefully by an eye specialist. Mm. And then there's other things like weight loss and fever that are unexplained. Mm. There I should put that caveat, that are unexplained. Mm. If you took your child to boarding school, for example, and they've been at home you know, with you all their lives, they will lose weight, obviously, because there's separation. You know, They don't eat well, they're missing their mom and dad, they will lose weight. That's yeah. explained. And also the exams. Are and the exams. <laughs> that's explained. Yeah. But here's your child who you've been with all along and suddenly, for no reason, yeah. they're losing weight and lots of weight. That's a flag. So that kind of unexplained weight loss. Unexplained fever. So children have fever. Almost every week when they're in school, they have a flu and fever, you know. They recover from this cough and then tomorrow somebody else brings a new cough, they get that cough and then they get the fever. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but the fever from cancer is fever that doesn't go away. Yeah. If your child has malaria, they'll have fever, you'll take your coatem, the blood slide turns negative, fever's gone, malaria's gone, they go back to their whatever. Yeah. But if in two weeks, again, it's malaria, then you go they treat it. And then in another two weeks, now it is typhoid. Yeah. Now it, so that fever that is unexplained, that's not resolving, yeah. that should cause you to worry about cancer. So there are many other signs and symptoms. Yeah. However, what I would like to, to summarize this with is childhood cancer, the signs and symptoms mimic commonly occurring conditions. Okay. Bleeding, fever can be malaria. Yeah. Bleeding, fever can be sickle cell disease. Yeah. Bleeding, fever can be any number of things. But the caveat is symptoms that do not go away mm. with appropriate treatment yeah. should warrant you to uh, have this looked into yeah. and maybe go to a higher level. Yeah. Okay, Look for a pediatrician mm. because they'll be able to help you. Don't go to the same dispensary. <laughs> In Uganda, we treat ourselves. Yeah. You know, you go to the pharmacy, you get some Panadol, and then you ask the dispenser in the pharmacy, oh, what should I take now? Then they give you this. Yeah. Then two weeks you go back, okay, now what should I take again? Please see a real serious children's doctor yeah. if you have these symptoms and signs. Or you can um, come and see Dr. Joyce Or herself. you can come, yeah, you can walk institute. into the Cancer Institute yeah. any day. Yeah. We have an open door policy. True. Okay, so what are the common types and treatments for children for, for childhood cancers? Okay, so um, there are obviously very many types of cancers in children. Mm. But um, the six big ones I'm going to talk about because they're most common include cancer of the blood, okay. which we call leukemia. Yes. And these have different types, but they're all cancer of the blood. Yeah. Okay. Then we have cancer of the kidney. Okay. Um, it all happens... For us as lay people, we call it the stomach, mm. really, but the abdomen. Yeah. So a swelling inside there, that's how it would present, yeah. cancer of the kidney. Yeah. A painless swelling inside your child's tummy that, you know, that shouldn't be there. Yeah. So that's cancer of the kidney. It's very common. Mm. Okay. Then three, cancer of the eye mm. that I talked about, where your child gets that white pupil. Yeah. Yeah, so cancer of the eye is also very, very common in children. It's one of the common ones. Yeah. And then cancer of lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are swell. Uh, Is that the one they call lymphoma? Yes, lymphoma. I'm about to lymphoma. be a doctor before. Yeah. <laughs> cancer of the lymph nodes. And yeah. we have several types of very common cancers of the lymph nodes, yeah. like bucket lymphoma you talked about. And there's another cancer called Hodgkin's disease. Yeah. But really those are swellings in lymph node areas, like for example in the neck or here in the armpits or in the groin. Usually that's the kind of presentation that they would have. Yeah. But bucket lymphoma many times is swelling of the face, like yeah. the facial bone. Yeah. So that's bucket lymphoma. And then we have also brain brain cancer. Brain cancer is a very common type of childhood cancer, but in Uganda we don't diagnose it. At all. Yeah. Um, maybe because we have myths about children who get these sorts of symptoms, they don't mm. present. Maybe they are taken to some kind of alternative medicine um, but we know for a fact that brain cancer should be almost as common as leukemia okay but we're not diagnosing it here in uganda mm. but uh, as much as we should yeah. so that's a challenge for us to make sure that we acquaint ourselves more with it yeah. 
Yeah. And this one normally presents with headaches that are unexplained. Yes. Children should not be getting headaches all the time. You know, once in a while, you know, how many times does a five-year-old tell you they have a headache? Almost never. When they don't want to go to school. <laughs> when they don't want. <laughs> Almost never. Yeah. You know, never. Yeah. But if you have a child who tells you, Mommy, I have a headache. Yeah. Then you're like, okay, fine, here's some Panadol. And, and then tomorrow, Mommy, I have a headache. Mm. You know, that headache that's persistent is a flag. Mm. Things like convulsions that are new. Yeah. Okay. If your child hasn't been getting convulsions, then suddenly they start to get convulsions. Yeah. So things like those, or a squint, a new squint, you know, cross eyes. Yes. Or staggering or unsteadiness. Yes. So those are some of the signs and symptoms of brain cancer. And so I've mentioned six common types of cancer. I want to mention especially in the adolescent. Yes. Not so common in children younger than 10, but adolescents, cancer of the bone a big deal for us and yeah. it comes very late that's why i want to talk about it yeah. most of them come having had symptoms for like eight months mm. and that takes me back to the swelling yes because a lot of bone cancer presents with a history of some kind of trauma yeah or he was riding a bike and then he fell off and then this leg started to swell and he swelled and swelled and swelled, and swelled. or he was playing football and then his friend kicked him mm. many times that history of cause or causality is a red Hearing. Yeah. But then we have children coming here after eight months. They've had this painful leg that has been gradually increasing in size. Yeah. And they've been getting diclofenac and putting all sorts of ointments. Mm. And it hasn't been getting better. Deep heat. Deep heat mm. and all these sprays. Mm. So bone cancer in adolescence especially is very common. Yeah. Yeah. So those are some of the common ones mm. that I can I can talk about here. That's 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 very informative. Thank you. And uh, the type uh, type of treatments, just uh, you can outline them. Okay. So um, so the treatment modalities in the world today have evolved to a very specialized level. Yeah. But the ones that are the traditional ones that even out there are still the backbone of treatment are three, mm. including surgery. So if there is a swelling somewhere or a lump, it's removed. Yeah. Usually has to be cut out and removed. Yeah. So surgery is a cornerstone treatment modality for cancer. Yeah. Then there is what we call chemotherapy. Yeah. Chemotherapy are drugs that we give through the vein, yes. like an IV line, yeah. or drugs that you swallow. They could be tablets. Sometimes we get parents here when we've given them chemotherapy and they're expecting some, I don't know what, shining, bursting thing. <laughs> but when you've given them tablets. Yes. Yeah, so chemotherapy can also be tablets that are ingested. Yes. So that's the second cornerstone of treatment. Yes. Then the third is radiotherapy. Yes. Radiotherapy, people here locally call it masanyalaze. Uh, but it, there's no electrocution <laughs> going on. It's yeah. a type of rays. They are kind of, of special rays. Yeah. It actually, when you go there, it's very anticlimactic. Yes. Because there's this machine that is lying above you or on the sides, and you lie there and you don't feel a thing. You don't feel heat, you don't feel whatever, for about five minutes actually, and then you're done. Yeah. So it's just direct some specialized types of rays into the cancer uh, where it is, and they also cause, um, they also kill um, cancer cells. Yeah. So that's radiotherapy as uh, the third cornerstone. These days, there are more sophisticated types of therapies out there. We've ventured into some of them at the Uganda Cancer Institute. It's something that we call targeted therapy. Mm. And targeted therapy is how you would call, um, what were these missiles? The missiles that hone in on something and kill it immediately. I don't know anything about missiles. You must know them. <laughs> the ones that lock onto a target. Mm. All these space fighting ships know them. Where you have, um, where you have these, uh, the homing missiles. Okay. Like they have a beacon somewhere and then you have your target somewhere and then you release the missile and it will go directly to that target. Yes. And not just, you know. So that's the difference between chemotherapy and targeted therapy. Yes. Chemotherapy is like knowing there's Osama Bin Laden in that village. Yes. And then you come with your, f your air, your flight, whatever, and drop a bomb on the village. Yeah. And the entire village will die, obviously, but yes. so will Osama. So will Osama. So that is the, <laughs> that is the, that yeah. is the um, philosophy, really. Yes. In very simple terms of chemotherapy. Okay. Hit the entire body with this toxic cell, uh, toxic chemotherapy. All the rapidly growing cells will die, including the cancer cells. Yes. But the advantage is that no more cells. Mm. which don't have cancer, are able to regenerate faster than okay. cancer cells. 
So the rationale is that if you do this often enough, you gradually kill for all the cancer cells. But in the process, the whole body suffers. Yes. But targeted therapy is exactly what it means. Target. Mm. It looks at the surface of the cancer cell. Mm. The surface, every cancer cell has, um, every type of cancer has some specific identifiers on its surface, for example. Yeah. Okay. Just like we are both girls, but you're Brandy and I'm Joyce. Yes. So they will get something that's Brandy. Yeah. Or something that's Joyce. Yeah. So if the missile has been targeted to Brandy, yeah. it will pass corners yes. and come and just find Brandy. Yes. So that's targeted therapy. Mm. It's very good because its side effect profile is very, you know, is very nice. Yeah. It doesn't make you feel too bad. It doesn't level the rest of your cells. Yeah. And we have some of that also here at the Uganda Cancer Institute already. We have drugs like rituximab that is used in the treatment of lymphoma that I talked about yeah. to improve the survival of lymphoma. Yes. We also have a drug like that called imatinib for a type of leukemia. So that's a new type. Then there's a new uh, therapy type called immunotherapy. It's also one of the sophisticated ones. Okay. But the three main ones, chemotherapy, surgery. All right. You seem to have all this under control, huh? uh, which, make, which means that the, the, the treatment of childhood cancers right here at the Institute is going on well. Though I would want, uh, despite the fact that not many, not everyone is presenting as, as, as required, but what challenges do you face while treating cancer in Uganda as a whole? It's a very, very big, 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 big question. I came with big questions. <laughs> it's a very big, big, big question. Yeah. And the challenges are there. There are very many. And um, you can look at these challenges from a health system perspective. And maybe that's how I will look at it. Because as Cancer Institute, what are the challenges we have? One, we are a resource-constrained country. Yeah. And so the available resources for cancer care uh, are minimal. Mm. I'll tell you why. The national budget, I think less than 10% goes to health care. It's some small figure, like 8%, uh. I think, of the national budget yeah. goes to health care. Yeah. And when you come to health care, communicable diseases like malaria, HIV... TB, T- tuberculosis. take the huge chunk mm. of all the, the national budget. Mm. And so when you come to non-communicable diseases, which are more expensive to treat and you treat for longer, we get just a small amount like this. Mm. So there's insufficient like, funding yeah, yeah. for for healthcare. And that makes it difficult for delivery mm. of such an expensive service for such a complex area yeah. um, to do it well. Yes. Having said that, maybe before I go into the next bit, even the uh, funding that comes from elsewhere, like from international partners and collaborators, mm. they all want to partner in communicable diseases. Yeah. Bill Gates Foundation and HIV, Clinton, Health Access. And so even they still fund communicable diseases. Mm. So we end up having non-communicable diseases and orphan area. Mm. So that for us is a challenge. Having said that, um, the government of Uganda is trying, and we'll talk about that later. Yes, when yes. we talk about uh, what it is that the government has done. Yeah. The second thing which we have <coughs> as a big, big challenge is a low level of awareness yeah. among everybody, yes. right from the public to the policymakers to the health workers. Even yeah. people don't know that cancer in children occurs. They yeah. get shocked. You mean even two children get cancer, <laughs> but actually, cancer happens. Yeah. And because there's a level, there's a lack of awareness about does cancer happen? Mm. If it happens, what does it look like? Mm. How is it treated? How expensive is it to treat cancer? Yes. Because this information is not there, we get up, we end up getting challenges along the entire spectrum of cancer control. Mm. Parents will not take their children in time because they don't think this is cancer. Or if they do take them at the health center, the doctors don't think it's cancer, yeah. so they also don't think about that being a diagnosis. Yeah. When it comes to resource allocation, when the people who budget for our country are cutting up the budget, they don't know enough about cancer. They don't know the burden of it. They don't know enough about how expensive it is to treat, and that's why healthcare financing mm. is very poor. Mm. So the level, the low level of awareness is a big, big problem, a challenge to us because it causes us to have poor resources, it causes us to have late presentations of our children, and when they present late, they have advanced stage disease, mm. and when their disease is advanced, then we have problems treating it with cure as an infant mm. for lack of knowledge. Yeah. 
Number three, treatment abandonment. I want to talk about treatment abandonment, not because in the literal sense, abandoning someone means you're doing it with, mal- with malice. Mm, you know, yes. you abandoned somebody, you knew the consequences and you just went away. But it's a terrible term, but it is the term that's used scientifically. Yes. And really it means that for whatever reason, mm. you failed to report for your treatment appointment yeah. for more than four weeks. That's abandonment. Mm. So, but really it just means uh, not coming for treatment. Yeah. So now, that's a big problem to us because even if it's malaria and you take the first dose of Coatem, and you're supposed to take your Coatem, let's say it's a drug you're supposed to take every day, yeah. and you take the first two days, the next two days you don't take it, you yeah. take instead on the fourth day, yeah. you won't be able to cure yourself, even if it's something like malaria. Yeah. So that's what treatment abandonment does to us. That you start off somebody with a curative intent, yeah. and then in the middle of their treatment, they don't show. They get overwhelmed. or they For whatever reason, reason, psychosocial yeah. reasons, many of them, you know, transport now there was covid mm. there were these many many reasons yeah, so, but yeah. for whatever reason there's a four week hiatus between the time that you should have gotten your treatment mm. that for us is a problem because if the tumor was this big mm. and you shrunk it to this much mm. okay the idea is every time you give chemotherapy you knock off the sensitive cells you knock them off you knock them off yeah. the moment it starts to grow again mm. what is growing are resistant cells actually yeah so if the resistant cells were this much, then you came back and it was this much of resistant cells. It means that your cancer is not as responsive to treatment as it was. Yeah. We have to come on now with bigger guns, more expensive, more toxic, less chances of cure. Of cure. So for us, that's a big challenge. Yeah. So I've talked about three big challenges. Mm. Yeah. One, resourcing. Resourcing. Or two, lack of knowledge. Three, treatment abandonment. I could talk about others, yeah. but those are some of the key ticket items. Okay. All right. I hope they, 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 we get it all gets better with time, which brings me to the next question. What steps have been taken towards improving childhood cancer care? I mean, you pioneered <laughs> childhood cancer care right here at the Institute. So between when you started <laughs> and now. And now. Okay, I think one of the things that Brandy, you were also trying to hint at that I can elaborate more as a challenge. I think is the issue of the psychosocial support. Yeah. I think let me mention that because it's one of the areas that things have improved. Yeah. When the government of Uganda provides the chemotherapy and the surgery mm. and the radiotherapy yeah. and whatever other scientific treatments they are. And drugs. They are not yeah. necessarily offering you a place to stay mm. when you're in Kampala. And remember, treatment of cancer is anywhere from 6 to 8 to 12 months even. Yeah. So if you come from Katakwi, mm. you have no relatives in Kampala, yeah. you are a peasant farmer, yeah. so you don't have cash. Yeah. But you don't go hungry, why? Because your farm is right next door, yeah. you grow everything that you need, you have your cow, you can get milk from it, you have your house, you're not starving, there's UPE, your kids are going to school, there's a well right down there, you can get your water, boil it and drink it. Yeah. So you can leave. But when you come to the capital, Mm. Even drinking water, you have to pay for it. Absolutely. Everything. Mm. So for somebody to expect you to live in the capital city for 10 months, <laughs> how are you going to survive? Yeah. And these are some of the things that contribute to treatment abandonment. Yeah. Because you just can't afford it. Mm. You can't afford water, you can't afford food, then you start starving. Accommodation. Accommodation, you can't. And yet, you can't say... Keep coming. Because remember, we need to see you almost every, sometimes three times a week, sometimes every week. Mm. Okay, fine. You can say, you know what? I can afford it. I mm. live in wherever, maybe Hoima. Mm. Okay? And it takes 45 minutes to get to Kampala or, or one hour. Yeah. But if you have a sick child, even if you have the money, mm. you can't keep putting that sick child through, that. through the traffic three times a week, two and four. You know, they are weak. Yeah. What if you come from Karamoja? I'm going to keep coming, no. even if I gave you money. Yeah. So we've had challenges with that sort of thing mm. in the past. So how have things improved? Things have improved in many ways, I must say. Yeah. So first and foremost, I'll start with the human resource. Yes. In the days gone by when I just came here in 20, 2009, we were a very small unit. The Cancer Institute was a small unit under the Department of Medicine in Mulago. Mm. So um, there was few people. 
when I came there was no pediatrician yeah. but there were very good physicians here looking after both the children and adults and the adults and so I joined as a first pediatrician subsequently we carved out the children's service those days we used to get about 250 new children every year now yeah. we get 700 but from one pediatrician and six children's nurses yeah we now have three pediatric oncologists and then we have two pediatricians yeah. and we also have fellows we have about 23 nurses so human resource for children to look after children like dedicated to looking after children i think has improved the situation yeah. is completely Mm. We now also have a pediatric surgeon. Yeah. Okay, and other. Yeah. So, and I thank for that I'm very thankful as you know the commitment of the institution and the government of Uganda for you know looking into this. The second thing is that the individual modalities of treatment I spoke about. Mm. There's been strides in each of them. Yeah. Let me talk first about chemotherapy. Yeah. Chemotherapy in the days gone by there was hardly anything. In fact, the only thing you could really reliably find here were antibiotics yeah. and morphine. Yeah. in 2009 yeah. most of the anti cancer drugs were stocked out most of the time and it wasn't uncommon for parents to uh, join hands mm. get somebody to get onto the bus the akamba mm. to go to nairobi overnight yeah by six o'clock they're in nairobi buy the drug get onto the bus in the evening and come back here so that their child can get some of these drugs that's yeah. how bad it was and it attracted a cost even mm. and those are the parents who could afford the overall majority couldn't So this so sounds expensive really. It was very expensive and it was not accessible to our parents. They yeah. can't afford. Yeah. They can't afford. So but since then, right now we have 90% of the drugs on the WHO essential medicines list and that's really a big milestone. WHO requires cancer treatment centers to have at least 80%. We have 90%. We are over and above. We're over and above. Yeah. So that means that for most childhood cancers in Uganda, we have what it takes to treat you from a chemotherapy perspective. Yes. At no cost to you. Yeah. Okay? Now, with regard to how available are these drugs most of the time? More than 90% of the time all these drugs. Mm. So in the children's service for example, rarely do we stock out. Yeah. And even when we stock out, for a very short period of time. Yeah. There are some cancers where we don't talk out at all. Mm. So to me there has been a massive improvement in the area of chemotherapy. Yeah. Both in terms of availability. Yes. I've talked about the uh, variety. Yeah. That now we have 90% availability of the different types of drugs. Yeah. But also importantly, we now have these new special medicines that I talked about, targeted therapy. Yes. At no cost. A cost of rituximab you might have to pay there were days you need to pay 8 million for a single dose of rituximab one dose one dose of which how many doses would i need <laughs> and like? you needed a dose every month for wow. like six months and so that's like you know expensive yeah right really really expensive and if you go to other countries in africa rituximab is still for pay mm. for highly insured patients and so forth and government officials so it's free here It's free here. Yes. You know, there are drugs like Glivec. Glivec is for a type of cancer. It's a very expensive targeted therapy. Yeah. But we have it here. Okay. So chemotherapy. Mm. We've done a lot. Yeah. Surgery yeah. is a cornerstone. Yeah. And I talked about the fact that yes, we've been working very very hard. We work together with the surgeons in Mulago. Pediatric surgeons in Uganda now are only six after all this time. So you can imagine how many they were at that time it was one actually yeah. let me just be very sincere. <laughs> it was one pediatric surgeon for everything. Yeah. And yet cancer surgery is specialized. Yeah. So it's not an area for general surgeons for the most part. Yeah. But now there's six pediatric surgeons. Mm. And Mulago here has the most of them. Yeah. And we work very closely with them. Yeah. But very importantly last year the institution took on its own pediatric surgeon for the first time. Yeah. So now we also have a pediatric surgeon at the cancer one of the six in the country. Yeah. Is at Uganda Cancer Institute. And so we are very happy because for us cancer is an emergency. Mm. Just like a road traffic accident is an emergency down there. Yeah. And if our children go down there the road traffic accidents take precedence because they are emergencies for them. Yes. But for us cancer is an emergency. Yeah. now we are able to undertake it on our own terms. Yeah. Radiotherapy, I need not say much. Yeah, I'm sure true. people have spoken about the new machine, the Linac, mm. state of the art, the only one of its kind in Africa. Very good for children. It's now available. 
what are some of the milestones that we have made? Maybe I should mention two more branding. Mm. We are conducting cutting edge research. Yes. Remember, cancer care is treated mostly in a research setting because we have to discover what are the new things that are working, yeah. especially in Uganda here and Africa. For the most part, we are using medicines, we are using dosages yeah. that have been arrived at using studies from outside countries. Yeah. But quite frankly, our biology, our genetic makeup is very different from those in outside countries. And those are some of the reasons that are being put forward for why our children may not be doing as well as they should mm. when we use the prescribed regimens. Yeah. But these regimens are prescribed by outside countries. Mm. So we need to do our own research, yeah. maybe using the same drugs, yeah. but we should be able to come up with, is this the dose that's right for our children? Yeah. Is this the combination that's right for our children? Yeah. So research is important. Mm. What are our most common cancers? How can we treat them better? Mm. Research is our resource. Mm. And right now, the children's service at the UCI is engaging in cutting-edge research, mm. clinical trials. Mm. That was not there before. Implementation research to see how we can use the tools available to us to refine our systems. You know, epidemiologic research, the big six cancers, we now know what's mm. our burden. Yeah. In the past, we didn't know. They would yeah. ask you, okay, which well, tumor is the most common? How common is it? Mm. Just say it's common. Yeah. It's common uh, how are they surviving? <laughs> like, oh, you see, we think in our observation. But now we have figures. Facts for and the figures. Exactly. Yeah. And this now informs planning yeah. for uh, people who are going to invest in. If you want to plan and say, for now, I want to level Wilms tumor. Mm. How much do I need? We can now make calculations because we know exactly what our burden is. We know exactly what our survival is. Yeah. We know how to improve. Yeah. And lastly, training. Mm. We now have our own fellowship training program in pediatric oncology. We are a regional center of excellence for training mm. for East Africa. Mm. So we are able to train other children's specialists <coughs> in cancer care. Yes. We've already trained our own. We have others in training. We have new ones that are coming in. And we are also able to train for the region. For example, currently we have two trainees from Burundi. Yeah. So I think this is very good. It is so costly to treat to teach, to train somebody in outside countries, in the medical field. Mm. I trained in Cape Town. It took me more than a year just to get the paperwork sorted, mm. to allow you to practice yeah. there, yeah. even though you're a trained pediatrician, but just going through all their permissions yeah. and the red tape, right? And even when you get there, to be there for a whole year, actually two years, it wasn't even here, with your family, the cost to the government of Uganda, it's... It's not practical. Yeah. You'll end up training only one person every two, three years. Yeah. But if you have your own training program, you can train as many. As you and can. they live next door. Their families are here. You don't spend too much money on them. Their quality of life is better. And we churn out people who are actually trained on the circumstances we have here. So they are able to be more real in what they do. Okay. So those are some of the strides that we I could say many more, but mm. these are big tickets. Uh, yeah, I agree. Thank you very much. You have answered, you've given big answers for a big question. And I'm glad as a country we are finding domestic solutions for our own domestic exactly. problems. Yeah, it's time we, we rescued ourselves. This uh, business of waiting for somebody to come and rescue us. <laughs> Nobody is coming. <laughs> we must save ourselves. Yeah. And uh, yeah. as you can hear, the word, the terms are being used here, instead of art, uh, cutting edge, it's like we're in Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy is happening <laughs> here. But let's move to the next question. There is an 80-20 situation in childhood cancer care around the globe. Uh, 80% of the children with childhood cancer care, with, with childhood cancers in high income countries survive and 20% in low and middle income countries survive with, with childhood cancer. Uh, lucky for us, we are just above 20%. But, and this initiative has been led by WHO, uh, for the WHO Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer Care. Tell us more about its impact on the Uganda Childhood Cancer Care. Okay, so first of all, the WHO Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, which is now called the GICC um, um, Initiative. It was launched by WHO and uh, UN and its other partners in 2018. Mm. And uh, this initiative was to realize um, an increase in survival of childhood cancer from 30% to 60% by the year 2030. I want to give this some context very briefly. Mm. We know that every year, 400,000 children are diagnosed with cancer annually, yeah. the world over. 
Yeah. Okay. And 90% of these live in developing countries, low and middle income countries, carry the burden of this 400,000 uh, diagnosed children with cancer annually. But in these developed countries that have only 10% of the burden, mm. survival is 80% and above. Mm. What do I mean by that? It means 8 out of 10 children who develop cancer will be cured. Mm. Five years down the road, they've already gone back to their lives. They continue to be productive citizens. Yeah. In low and middle income countries, where 90% of the global burden of childhood cancer is, mm. the survival is 30% or less. Yeah. In fact, in some parts of Africa, it's 10%. Yes. Meaning, out of 10 children who get cancer, seven will die of yeah. their disease, or eight, or even nine will die of their disease. Now, this disparity is alarming to yeah. the world. Yeah. Okay? It's an emergency. And the challenge here, or the reason that this was concerning, is that the reasons that the survival discrepancy is are manageable. Yeah. Things like, you know, socioeconomic circumstances, training, and so forth. So there are reasons that are surmountable. Mm. So the global initiative is to cause an increase in survival of childhood cancer globally yeah. from 30% to 60% by the year 2030. Yes. By doing whatever it is that we can do to level these barriers. Yeah. So low and middle income countries we are contributing to the 30%. Yeah. So if we improve ourselves as low and middle income countries then the survival generally yeah. increase to 60% by the year 2030. Yeah, okay. So that's the global initiative and we are all working towards that uh, that target. Yeah. Now additionally with this global initiative to realize this improvement in survival Yeah. There are six targeted cancers and the good thing I talked about them. Or, yeah, absolutely. And they are, are, are they are our most common cancers incidentally here as well. Mm. And the reasons that they were targeted is because they are curable. Yeah. First of all, they are very common even here in Uganda they are the most common. Okay. Two, they are very curable within what we have. Yeah. You don't need to be having some kind of rare, you know, space machine. Mm. Within what we have, they are curable. So <clears throat> we need to work towards targeting these to achieve this survival. Okay. That's awesome. So who are the partners that continue to support us as we are on this journey of childhood cancer care? So um, we have partners. Okay, I must say uh, the Cancer Institute is a government institute. True. And so I will not mention government because yeah. all government <laughs> sectors are government. This is the government. This is the government. <laughs> But we have partners, yeah. uh, local partners and international partners. Yeah. I want to start with the local partners because mm. um, they do a lot. And many times when people talk of partners, they jump to talk about what American, German companies are partnering. <laughs> But actually, we have a lot of partners locally. Yeah. Civil society. Civil society, these are the people who don't have cancer really. Yeah. But they, they are not health workers. Yeah. But they do their work to improve uh, the outcome of children with cancer. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I really want to recognize our civil society partners. Uh, one of them being Uganda Child Cancer Foundation. Hello. That is actually doing this to raise awareness. Yeah. Awareness is key as I talked about. Absolutely. But we have other organizations like Place a Child Foundation, yes. Kawempe Home Care. Yeah. And these two, you remember the problem I mentioned about our children having to sleep on verandas um, or having to abandon treatment because they couldn't be, they couldn't be brought in every day. Yeah. Now these two civil society partners actually run hostels that are dedicated to children yeah. with cancer. Yeah. So as I speak now, none of our children sleeps on the veranda. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. None of our children fails to access treatment because they have no transport or yeah. they have nothing to eat while they're in Kampala. Yeah. So that is thanks to our civil society partners. Mm. Kawempe be home care based the child. Yeah. Then we have other civil society partners that just comfort parents, mm. fellow parents. These are a group of parents or caregivers of children with cancer. Either their children are alive and cured or their children died or whatever. But they then support other children uh, other parents who are going through this journey. Yeah. Because a lot of the things we do here we don't look into that at all. We're so overwhelmed looking after the children That's true. that nobody is even thinking of the parents and what they're going through and the emotional trauma and the knowledge that they're looking for and so forth. So we have civil society that does that. 
Yeah. Then we have other civil society. Today I was at a function with the FCU bank and, 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 the, and minister. the minister of health. Mm. Yeah, DFCU bank just did a play area for the children on the ward. Play therapy is critical to children. Remember, children are children. Yes. Whether they have cancer or not, children need to be children. Yes. They need to be able to play. They need to be able to do whatever to watch it TV. is. To watch TV. And to be distracted from the painful therapy yeah. and the fear of the unknown around cancer. Yeah. So we didn't really have that at the Cancer Institute. Thanks to DFCU Bank, we have a state-of-the-art, amazing play therapy area. Yeah. I wish, Brandy, you had a picture of it. Maybe I'd, you'll I'd, find I'd, it I'd, and wish, share uh, it. Absolutely. It's beautiful. Even I want to be inside there. And the courts are so <laughs> inspirational, yeah. the ones that are in there. Very, very nice. So that's civil society partnership, right? Yeah. So and, and there are others locally who come and help us with food uh, for the children to make sure that they get healthy, balanced diets. We have international partners. St. Jude's Children's Cancer, uh, Children's Research Hospital very good partners. Fred Hatch Cancer Research Center. Yes. We are sitting in this building now. They've been with us for 10 years. I can't even say how much they've done for our children. Here. And this building is state of the art, guys. And this is a state <laughs> of the art building. And some of the groundbreaking research I'm talking about yeah. with the rituximab and now we're going to do research in our leukemias. Some of even our Wilms tumor yeah. we're undertaking that research with our collaborative partner Fred Hatch. Yeah, okay? that's awesome. Then we have others like Solitaire. Mm. Solitaire is our partner. It's <laughs> it looks after our children in northern Uganda, yeah. amongst other things. So that's also our partner. Oh yes, when 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 uh, when 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 Gulu we were at Lacho and we found yeah. them there. Yeah. yeah, Solitaire does amazing, amazing work, and now we are working together with them in shared care yeah. for our children in Lacho. They do a lot of awareness creation and so. Forth. Mm. And that is solitary. Then we have our partners, Cambridge University, yeah. with whom we are working on how to improve chemotherapy safety for our children. Yeah. Because remember, these drugs are highly toxic. They are chemical. In fact, in of themselves, they cause cancer. Yeah. So you have to be very careful how you administer them. Yeah. And we need very good protocols that are very clear and very tightly monitored. Mm. And some of these, we have to develop them locally to adapt them. Mm. If I can explain this, if you look at the protocols, the way they are wielded, say in the UK, mm. they require that at any one time there are two nurses, one is reading, the other one is proofreading, and they are both looking at the same value. Yeah. Then it goes on to the pharmacy where in there, there are, I don't know how many three people who are doing what. Yeah. Then when it is going to be dispensed, there is somebody who is checking. There's Even administering, there is. Mm. So they, they, it's so human resource intensive. Mm. Yet for us here, we have Shona. Mm. The one pharmacy. So is our she can't do all this. <laughs> yeah. And even the nurses. At any one time on the ward, you have just a few. So you really don't have the luxury of someone is standing here, the other one is proofreading, mm. and the other one is doing that. They are multitasking. So we needed to find a way to make the protocols safe, yeah. but still doing the right thing. Yeah. And so some of our partners, like Cambridge University, for example, we're undertaking a massive project with them yeah. to do just that, yeah. improve chemotherapy safety. Yeah. And then American Cancer Society. We're just concluding a massive project with them to improve safety for health workers that are dealing with chemotherapy. Because yeah. remember, we have 80% of our population are nurses, women in childbearing age. Yeah. And they're working here in this area with chemotherapy that's toxic. So we've worked on a massive project with them yeah. to improve on chemotherapy safety for our health workers. Yeah. Even our cleaners that are getting rid of the waste and so forth. Yeah. So we have many collaborative partners. Yeah. Our radiotherapy machines. International Atomic Energy Agency is our collaborating partner to make sure that these nuclear materials yes. are safe, yeah. you know, and they are in safe hands whilst they are here to make sure we have the right metrics, to make sure we don't infect the whole of the greater Kampala area with our radiation and so forth. Absolutely. So we have a lot of partners yeah. and we can have a whole list of them, um, but those are some of the ones I can mention. We thank you as citizens of Uganda. We thank you on behalf oh of... Oh, yes. The I have to mention one other partner. How could I forget? Ooh. Nation Media Group. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Nation Media Group is yeah. a local partner. Yeah. With Nation Media Group, we have a fundraising drive going on. Please join that fundraising drive because we're raising 2 billion Uganda shillings. 2 billion Uganda shillings. And the reason for that is to construct a center of excellence for children with cancer. Yes. I can say we do have facilities for children with cancer at the UCI, but they are scattered on our campus. We have three campuses. Yes. So if you have a sick child and you have to take them down to the clinic, and then after they're done, then you have to carry them to the other place there where there's the next service, and then you have to take them up the hill to the ward. The services are scattered, and yet the staff are few. 
Yeah. If the services are together, you can focus everything there, specialize the staff. So now I need to have two different teams of nurses. I have a team on the ward, I have a team in the clinic because they are in a geographically separate area. Yes. But if everything is together, then the nurses can move in the spaces. Yeah. So we can have more availability of nurses. We can tailor make everything, and that is what excellence is called for. True. Centers of excellence. And the space is already there. Architectural designs are already there. Mm. I'm so excited. I'm so and worried. now <laughs> Nation Media Group is raising, is leading this campaign yeah. for the two billion to establish the center of excellence for children yeah. with cancer in our country. And to me, if that is the only thing I achieve for the rest of my life, I will have done. I'll have done my part. You will die a happy woman. I'll die a happy woman. <laughs> yeah, happy yeah, so doctor. I can't say thank you enough for Nation Media Group for yeah. taking on this challenge. Okay. Please feel free to participate in that fundraising drive. Uh, in that state of art, there will still be classrooms, play areas, stuff, just the whole center of excellence, as Dr. Balagade has said. Uh, Dr. Balagade, COVID-19 came like a wave, and some of us didn't know what to do with it. Then eventually <laughs> figured it out. But how did this affect your day to day? Yeah, COVID-19 devastated many things globally. Mm. It caused devastation of the health system. Yeah. Okay, I want to talk about the other things. Mm. It devastated the entire financial, global economy mm. and so forth. But if we are to become very real to the Cancer Institute and the children, COVID-19 affected us. Yeah. Why? Let's start off with the staff. Um, we had these lockdowns okay. in Peru. Uh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. had this. Okay, let me first say that COVID nineteen, <laughs> the virus itself, yeah, was more of a devastation in adults in yeah. terms of the illness. Yeah, yeah, they, they died more. They went to ICUs, so they were more affected yeah. by the virus. Yeah, okay, children not so much. Yeah, maybe a little bit more in the second wave, but on the whole, not so much. Yeah. But children were indirectly affected to a great degree. Why? Because children are dependent. Yeah. A child will not bring themselves to hospital. A child will not feed themselves. The child requires their parents. So if their parent oh, is sick yeah, yeah. of COVID, then the child also doesn't come. So children were indirectly affected by COVID. As you saw, even the schools shutting down. Yes. The schools also shut down. Um, so children didn't go to school. Why? Because their parents were there. So it was an indirect yeah. But it has had significant impact on us yeah. because, one, delayed presentation, yeah. maybe even no presentation, right? Because um, of the lockdown, yeah. first of all, nobody could travel. Yeah. And only the really sick, dying ones were, you know, allowed through to come. So they would count the Cancer Institute really advanced. Yeah. Then we got a number of our children defaulting treatment. Yeah. And that's the abandonment I talked about. Yes. Not so much because they didn't want to come, but they had no way of coming. They had no way of coming. Um, they yeah. had no way of coming. Really. Yeah. So we've, we, we, got, we got that a lot. Yeah. And we know that we shall see the effects of it. Uh, our survivors are going to be affected down the road. Because remember I mentioned to you, if you don't get your dose right, then you affect your outcome. True. So we're waiting with bated breath. We're yet to see the effects that has had. Mm. And then, of course, there was the effects on our staff. Yeah. Because uh, our staff also couldn't come to work <laughs> True. because of the lockdown mm. in the different spaces, the wards, the labs, the whatever. And I know there were various measures put in place to try and minimize it, but it did affect us. Mm. And even the staff becoming overworked because mm. they had to move themselves into silos. Yeah. And you have a shift A that works for three days, then the shift B works for three days alone. Yeah. That means you're halving the staff. Yeah. So it means if the ward was manned by two people, now it's being manned by one person mm. for three days and so forth, which was really overwhelming mm. to our staff, affected their health, their mental health, and the quality of care. Mm. And that obviously also affects the children. And um, we got a, some of our staff falling sick. Mm. In fact, we're dealing with some of the fallout from our staff falling ill, obviously. Mm. Um, so... I would say on the whole, COVID-19 affected us yeah. as well, mm. um, as well as all other health sectors. I want to commend, though, the government and the Cancer Institute. We were not affected as much as we could have been. Because yeah. when you heard what went on elsewhere in the world, 
you would just think of Uganda and just think that you know we're all going to be finished. We're closed for we're business. Closed. <laughs> yeah. But actually, because of the model that Uganda has taken for cancer care, yeah. meaning that it has established a center of excellence for treating cancer yeah. only, only, not malaria, not uh, breast, uh, whatever Sinuses things, or, mm. nothing, mm. strictly cancer. Yeah. It means that when Mulago Hospital and Nagura and all the other places were overrun with COVID and everybody else was struggling, UCI continued to function because for us our core area was cancer. Yeah. We were not treating COVID. In fact, if we identified COVID, we would send to the cancer, tre- I mean the COVID treatment sites. Yeah. So services continue to run. Yeah. And up to now, some of the more developed countries are benchmarking us as Uganda. Yeah. They wanted to know how is it that you kept your services running. And I think part of it was yeah. And then there were other issues where we, uh, of course, partnered with the bus companies to take our parents back up country and give them for appointments. Yeah. So there were some things that actually went well yeah. uh, for us at the Cancer Institute. Yeah. Yeah. Even after COVID, uh, like what am I even saying after COVID? Uh, Airport, we were able to actually start vaccination here. I, exactly. Yes. How could I even mention I'm that? I'm fully vaccinated because yeah, of I'm the also cancer. Fully va- <laughs> I'm fully vaccinated. And I'll tell you another exciting thing. Yes. Just maybe a couple of weeks ago now that they've started vaccinating children. Yeah. And because we have a vaccine center here, children are being vaccinated now. Yeah. The children with cancer. Yeah. That's cool. So we are vaccinating our children 12 to 18 years now. We have the Pfizer vaccine mm. and we're able to vaccinate our children. And those who have children with chronic diseases, mm. uh, they can also come and check with us because we are vaccinating children have the Pfizer vaccine. Oh. So that's one of the other things that actually came out yeah. for us during COVID that was really nice. Yeah. And it's working very efficiently, I know for a fact, because yeah. I've tested the service myself. Yes, of course. Uh, the, 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 do, the, witness, the best witness is the person who has tested the service. Yeah. 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 And also, uh, roughly, how is the East African Pediatric Oncology Fellowship going? Oh yeah, so the, the East African Oncology Fellowship Program is going I yeah. must say that uh, we're very proud of the program. Yeah. We are offering an excellent uh, quality apprenticeship based program mm. that has um, a lot of um, practical hands on yeah. in a resource constrained setting, I must say. So we're not going to be working like you're in Texas or in uh, <laughs> uh, you know, one of New those high tech areas. Dizzy. But for a resource constrained center, yeah. we are a center of excellence. Okay? Yes. Um, but two, also, it has a very uh, heavy research component because we want to prepare our young trainees mm. to be able to conduct research in childhood cancer independently, but also to be able to interpret research findings from other studies and not just cut and paste, but be able to interrogate and synthesize and say, actually, this works for us. Mm. This is how I can use this new information. Yes. It also has a um, an administration component because we're trying to train our fellows to be able to work independently and start up their own units when they go back. So I can say it's been very successful. We have uh, graduated some of our fellows. We have fellows from the region. Like I mentioned earlier, currently we have two fellows from Burundi uh, that are undertaking training with us and they are the first two trained um, um, doctors in childhood cancer in Burundi. So we are going to work with them they are going to be where I was, mm. or where UCI was yeah. uh, almost 10 years ago. Yeah. But because we've walked that journey already, we know exactly how we're going to support them. Mm. So they are with us till um, January next year, and we hope to get more regional fellows. There is light at the end of that tunnel. Yeah, there is light. Uh, yeah I believe so. Uh, how can we do better? As we were, how, do we, how can we do better? Okay, how can we do better? As a nation, as a people, as a... I think that... Childhood cancer is curable. Yeah. Our hand. Yeah. That was the hashtag for the International Childhood Cancer Day. Mm. We also used that for Gold September. Yes. Many times people can be the way I was when I stumbled into UCI those many years ago and I was thinking to myself, what can I possibly do here? Yeah. I'm a pediatrician. I know nothing about cancer. But actually I got in here and discovered that just by treating dehydration the right way, and treating malaria the right way, the small little bits and pieces that are special to children, I could make a difference. So my appeal, I think, is we can actually contribute to improving childhood cancer survival. Mm. It's through our hands. We have everything. We can all join. Like, for example, DFCU, put their hands together, 
and then we have this nice play area for the children so that they can they can be uh, less tortured yeah yeah they can be distracted you can join our hands like say what bless the child is doing yeah. what home to home care is doing yeah. they're now providing accommodation for our children yeah. there's some of the special drugs that sometimes talk out yeah. and we have some partners who help in that area specifically Yeah. There's always something that we can do. Yeah. You can join the fundraising drive. Yeah. And all you need to contribute is a thousand shillings. Yeah, right? but you can and also make it 10,000. You can even make it 10,000 and <laughs> you can make it a million. Yes. But because it is it is it is that little. Yeah. If we all gave that 1,000 shillings, yeah. we shall surely have a center of excellence for our children yeah. and improve our survival. That's right? true. Yeah. That, that's a few times that the The, the how how large our population is becomes helpful because if 58 million people give 1000 shillings can you imagine <laughs> that's already like about yeah. 58 million imagine that yeah. yeah also i want to bring it to your attention i'd like to bring it to your attention that this year has been great so many people have been able to come and do donations rock telecom came and brought wheelchairs oh yes and TVs for and the and we are enjoying them on the world i must thank rock telecom <laughs> yes <laughs> i so didn't you- omit you because Uh, but uh there's a long list it's a long list there's right, i'm yeah. just trying to enrich your list eh? yes. Yes, so rock telecom thank you very much yeah. i know they're working with our adolescents i yeah, know yeah, adolescent friendly tab- spaces yeah to yeah. get them tabs uh, they're not watching cartoons with the younger children yeah. Yeah. also uh b and zika gave us an audition oh yes thank you very much b and zika and you are a yes okay you oh, see we thank you you are a <laughs> so you can remember be, yeah. and you are a i must say we have white boards on our ward we use those white boards to communicate to each other yeah. for the different children so that the person who comes at night for example for the night shift yeah can know immediately who is on this bed and what are the key things that we need to be doing for Yes. And those white boards by the bed were given to us by URA. So yeah. thank you URA. Guys, yeah. we're doing amazing things and I'm proud that everyone can help the way in in the different ways they can. So Dr. Joyce, I see we are having so much fun, but I hate to be the bearer of bad <laughs> news. <laughs> we have come to the end of this podcast. Yeah, it was lovely. But I want to I have a joke for you before we go. Yep. Are you ready? Why shouldn't you write with a broken pencil? Why shouldn't I write with a broken pencil? Because it's broken? Yes, which make which means it is broken. It's broken. So the because the pencil is broken, you can't write with it because it's pointless. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it's pointless. <laughs> Yes. That's right it's pointless. Yes. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Thank you. Yeah, thank uh, you but, Brandy. Yeah, but thank you very much yeah. for uh, joining us today. Uh, thank you too. and thank you guys for following up with the Live It Up podcast. Uh, the activity for this week is uh of course, we're jogging, guys. <laughs> we're jogging. You know, when you and you have to be consistent as the doctor just said, when you start something, you have to be you have to do it to the end. In that way you don't have to incur the side effects and so much more. Uh once again we have been the Uganda Child Cancer Foundation, the Uganda Cancer Institute, the Tribe UG, Afron, E-class on the productions, we have LNF undisputed on the photos that you'll be seeing on our social media. And it has been a great team. Find them on their socials everywhere. Also Dr. Joyce, do you have your socials as well? Yes, I do. W- where, what's your handle on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's my handle? It's J Kampukwa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, J- yeah, you'll find it also on the lower third. Uh thank you for being part of us. This has been great and I've been your host Brandy. Till next time. Bye. Bye-bye.